all the of all the fallacies I found. Um, the first and most obvious problem is that you committed an elementary fallacy called the genetic fallacy wherein you posit that because you know why Aristotle propagated his unmoved mover concept in this case to avoid drinking hemlock that it has any bearing on the truth behind the concept simply knowing why someone says something or how they came to believe it nearly takes away from nor adds to the credibility of the truth something is either true or not true regardless of why someone proposes it. Furthermore, you failed to mention that Thomas Aquinas also proposed this same concept, as did John Philipponus, Al-Kindi, Saida Gayan, Al-Ghazali, St. Bonaventure, and not to mention modern-day theologian William Lane Craig. So to use Aristotle's motive as evidence against the concept is useless, yet this seems to be a thing you hang on to throughout your presentation. Next, you say that Aristotle believed it was impossible to posit an intellectual infinity, or that things cannot have been in motion always and forever, so there had to be a point when someone started it. But then you suggest that Aristotle was really saying is that things have always been in motion, and you support this claim by slipping the idea of God into the supposition. What you have done here is label God a thing, and then suggest that because he is a thing, and since he being a thing set all other things into motion, then it must be reasonable to conclude that things have always been in motion. Yet all you have done is commit the fallacy of equivocation by defining the unmoved mover, i.e. God, in, by your definition, as a thing no different than the things he sets into motion. In other words, you define physical reality, i.e. the universe and the things in it, and metaphysical reality, or the unmoved mover, as the same type of existing entity. But this is not the case. Aristotle certainly didn't believe it to be the case. He believed there was a metaphysical cause with entirely different ontology than the things it was setting into motion. So he wasn't saying that things have always been in motion. You came to that conclusion by fallaciously equivocating the word things. Then you go on to say that it has been accepted as absolute fact that things start and couldn't have all been there forever. You go on to ask, what is forever? And then you answer yourself, well, forever is time, and time exists where things are, where stuff is. That means time has always existed as long as there was anything. Then you go on to say that the one thing we cannot posit then is that there could have been a beginning. You support this claim, again, by equivocation. You are essentially saying that the unmoved mover is a thing, like all other things, and since time exists where things are, then the unmoved mover is subject to the same constraints as time. But by this simple fallacy, you conclude that there could not possibly have been a beginning. Then you comically suggest that Aristotle would agree to this. But you must understand the argument if you are going to try to refute it and you obviously have not the faintest idea of the true nature or essence or state of existence that the unmoved mover is or has in this concept. By placing it in the same category as the very things it is said to have started, you are not dem merely diminishing its nature, you are simply wrong in your concept of it. Let me try to clear it up for you. The unmoved mover is thought to be completely and utterly separate from the physical universe. It is believed to be transcendent in nature, whereby it shares absolutely zero ontology with a physical thing. The unmoved mover itself is not a thing. It has no mass, no substance, no physicality. It is not composed of matter. It does not exist with the constructs, within the constraints of the universe and is therefore beyond the constraints of time. It is timeless in that sense because time only exists, as you pointed out, in the universe where things exist. Time is merely fourth dimension of our reality. Yet the unmoved mover does not exist in our reality. So it is transcendent, non-physical, and timeless, which means it's eternal. Your next claim is that the unmoved mover is not only ridiculous, but it's impossible because who created the unmoved mover? Well, this is yet another fallacy called an appeal to ignorance, whereby you dismiss the claim simply because you can't explain it. 
Furthermore, you say we still end up at infinite regress because we now have to explain who created the unmoved mover, and then who created it, and then who created that one, and so on and so forth. But this is just evidence that you misunderstand the concept. Aristotle was not arguing for creation. He was arguing for motion. Remember, the unmoved mover is, is an eternal, transcendent entity that set the physical universe into motion. It was never created. It has always existed. You seem to have no problem with the idea that existence has always been. In fact, you say, let's just say existence was always there. And whether his name is the unmoved mover... Oh, but wait, we can't do that. Existence was there. Existence has always been there. Well, always been there would be... Always been where would be my first question. What do you mean by existence? Because it seems as if you are granting ontology to existence, but that would be redundant. Existence can't be anywhere, as if it can move from one place to another, or as if it can occupy a space as if it has mass or volume. See, existence isn't a thing. To exist is to have essence and to have being. But then we have to talk about metaphysical existence versus physical existence. Again, it seems you are equating the two. I guess now would be a good time to talk about necessary being and contingent being. Remember, Aristotle's chief argument was about a necessary being that could set into motion the contingent being, in this case, the universe. Yet you seem to make no distinction between the two. Then you say that cause and effect are only identifiable inside of reality. But that is only true regarding causes and effects that occur within this physical reality that we call the universe. So again, you are equivocating the terms by suggesting that the same type of reality exists physically and metaphysically. But that isn't the case. We are back on the division of necessary versus contingent being. By your rule, we can only identify causes and effects that occur within contingent reality. But that says nothing about the cause of that contingent reality, which by your rule cannot be known since it is the cause of the very reality by which you are subjecting the rule to. Furthermore, we are not talking about causes and effects. We are discussing the first cause, the efficient cause, and consequently the first effect, in this case physical reality itself, i.e. the beginning of contingent being. On a side note, you have also reverted back to a, an appeal to ignorance, whereby you deny cause and effect simply because it is unidentifiable. But we can, we can only identify that which exists in the universe with our five senses. Just because we can't identify a cause, that does not mean the cause is not necessary. It simply means we do not have the faculties for identifying it. This is a textbook example of an appeal to ignorance. Now back to cause and effect, you state that when we mention cause and effect, we have already assumed reality. Therefore, you conclude that we must begin with the assumption that things just exist, and you say Aristotle would concede to this as well since he contends that things exist, and you include the unmoved mover in that category. Here, here we are again back to the fallacy of equivocation, whereby you lump the unmoved mover together with the very things it is believed to have set into motion. And lastly, you have committed one of the most common and elementary fallacies in all of logic, the straw man fallacy, and you compound it with yet another fallacy of equivocation. You say that Aristotle's God is perfect, uh, perfect being the key word here, and therefore unchangeable, and therefore he sets the universe into motion, and now he just thinks about himself because change is unnecessary in a perfect God, so what else could he do but think about himself? Yet again, you are lumping together the perfect, which is the unchangeable, infinite, eternal, unmoved mover, with the changeable, finite, temporal universe which he set into motion. Then you conclude that he wouldn't think about the universe which he set into motion because he is unchangeable. But the universe is not unchangeable. In fact, the only thing constant in the universe is change. So by assuming the attributes of Aristotle's God are interchangeable with the attributes of the universe that he set into motion, you have set up a straw man, attacked it, and then patted yourself on the back for a job well done. You know, Aristotle posited the unmoved mover, some people say, because he wanted to save himself from Macedonian hemlock. I got that from Will Durant's story of philosophy, and I believe the accusation is general. Um, the, the fact that things are moving, according to Aristotle's um, statement that we need an unmoved mover, the fact that things are moving means that someone had to start them, for it, it is impossible to um, posit an intellectual 
infinity, a regress going back infinite, in, infinitely to say things have been moving always and forever. Therefore, since that's not possible for them to have always been moving, uh, we have to therefore posit someone to have started it. That right there is, if you get to that point where Aristotle's positing that, you can stop right there and say, oh, what he's saying here is things have always been in motion. And I'm going to slip in the idea of a god right here on this supposition, which now has been accepted as an absolute fact that there has to be some place where things start. It couldn't have all been there forever. Now, what does forever mean? It means time. And where does time exist? Time exists where things are, where stuff is. That means time's always existed as long as there was anything. The one thing that we cannot posit, then, I think Aristotle would probably agree if he weren't subject to the Athenian uh, Council of 400, the one thing we cannot posit is that there was a beginning. There could not have been a beginning. There must always have been. For example, if, if the unmoved mover is there, because you know, we have to have him to start things off. Who put him there? As my philosophy professor said in my first year of college, he said, what, another unmoved mover with a bigger tractor? And then who put him there? A bigger tractor? And then... So you're in an infinite regress if you try to start things. And I think that Aristotle would agree. I, I, I don't know for sure, but, you know, the, it's... It's just everything that Aristotle ever, any reason he ever gave for anything, any explanation he ever gave was very subtle. Um, so, just because it's a good explanation, I mean, he was a he was a genius. Anything he explains is is quite well explained, even if he's completely wrong. Um, so you know, it's been said no one's made more uh, errors than Aristotle um, because no one wrote on as many things as Aristotle did, but he most likely posited the unmoved mover to save himself from Macedonian hemlock, like Socrates, because Socrates, of course, was put to death for questioning religion, questioning the gods, for corrupting the youth. Uh, and Aristotle didn't want to mess around with that. He wanted to live happily in Athens, the best city on the planet. Uh, and the unmoved mover is not only ridiculous. It's impossible because who created the unmoved mover? You, you're in an infinite regress no matter what. So let's start the infinite regress off with existence. And let's say the existence was there and whether existence's name be the unmoved mover who started things? Well, wait a minute. So wait, we can't do that. So existence was there. Existence has always been there. That's where you have to start. And I think Aristotle would agree just by the reductio ad absurdum. You know, he says we can't have an infinite regress of explanation. Uh, we can't go back and say that there was an effect, an effect, an effect from a cause, from a cause, from an effect, from a cause, from an effect, from a cause, somewhere it started. Uh, but actually, cause and effect are phenomena that are only identifiable inside reality. So if you've ever been able to say there was a cause or an effect, you've already assumed reality. So we have to, first of all, say something existed. Things exist. That is the first assumption. Uh, and Aristotle has to make that too, because he assumes the existence of either the universe or an unmoved mover to start the universe in motion. So he also assumes existence. Uh, actually, the unmoved mover is just a way to sneak God in, in a very subtle way that's very difficult for people to point out what's wrong with it. A very elegant, very poetic... Um, the thing I like most about the unmoved mover... <laughs> read Will Durant's Story of Philosophy, because at the end of it he says, such is Aristotle's God. And here is Aristotle's God. Um, he's perfect. He only wants to think about perfect things. Change is imperfect, so he doesn't want to think about change. He is the most perfect thing, therefore he spends all of eternity thinking about himself. He started the universe moving and then he sits and thinks about himself. That is Aristotle's God. You know, Compare that to just about any other god that you find anywhere. And Aristotle's god is a total metaphysical deadweight. It doesn't do anything. It started the universe in motion. We don't need gods after that. The unmoved mover is the god, started everything in motion, and here we are. That's Aristotle's story. Plus, if he's going to assume the existence of an unmoved mover as causing things, a will, 
If he's going to anthropomorphize willpower onto the universe's existence, he's, he's also got to say that that unmoved mover existed. So he posits existence. I don't think it's too much to say that the unmoved mover is not only obviously impossible,